Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, featuring the sharpest minds in marketing, inspirational case histories, and weekly insights you can apply to your business. Download it over 150 times. Find out why top CMOs rank this podcast among their favorites. Now, here's your host, Chief Marketing Renegade, Drew Neiser. My guest today is Megan Eisenberg, CMO of MongoDB, a database company that went public in 2017 and is on several analyst lists as the next billion-dollar unicorn. In a recent video, Megan noted that MongoDB's database is downloaded 40,000 times a day and that their, quote, full-throttle marketing approach has driven a 73% increase in leads, a 33% uh, uh, increase in sales accepted leads, and a 20 27% increase in funnel velocity. Those are a lot of big, powerful numbers. Um, for you fans of account-based marketing, those are big, or should I say Mongo, performance <laughs> improvements. Um, Megan, by the way, is a veteran tech marketer with experience at global businesses ranging from startups to mid-market to Fortune 500. She's been part of, this is amazing, you have the golden touch, eight successful exits since 2011 as an operator and advisor, including two IPOs and six mergers and acquisitions. A little bit more background and then we'll start. And she has an engineering degree and an MBA from Yale, but promises to dumb all of this down for me. Huh. Uh, yes. Yeah. So Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. And uh, what I'd like to do is let's start with Renegade Rapid Fire and let's just uh, get to know you a little bit. And so tell me, what's your definition of marketing? Sure. I think marketing is attracting, converting, and keeping customers or delighting them. Okay. Clean. What is the primary role of the chief marketing officer? Yeah, I mean, I think about it as reach and revenue when you think about awareness and then driving the business. But as a, a CMO, I also think about three circles. One, how I help us lead within the industry and lead the industry. Two, how I help lead the company. And then how I lead my function as a marketer. Interesting. And uh, an earlier episode with um, Greg uh, Welchip, Spencer Stewart, we talked a lot about leadership. And it's interesting that you went right there right away. But he really uh, emphasizes that, uh, as, as my listeners will know. Okay, so what is... Um, the top priority for you as a CMO right now? Yeah, right now it is, uh, my top priority is MongoDB Atlas. It is our self-serve product. It's a database as a service and we launched it about two years ago and it's growing very fast. It's 18% of our business and will be probably half our business by the end of next year. So for people listening who don't really understand what that means, what is database as a service? Sure. So we like to say that we allow you to build for developers the app and not worry about the ops. So we take care of all the back end, the upgrades, anything you need on the back end. So you can just focus on what you love and what you're building within the product. And these developers are website developers. These are app developers. They're app developers. They're mobile developers. Yes. Okay. Um, and so these folks uh, license your product, essentially pay on a monthly basis in order to sort of put all their data in the cloud and different formats, and then they can suck it out for their applications. Yes, we actually have on-premise. People are running MongoDB on-premise. Uh -huh. People are running it in the cloud, and there's hybrid as well. And we're on Amazon, uh, GCP, and Azure. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite part of the job? Uh, I would say the innovation within marketing. I'm a huge fan of MarTech uh, and just seeing what you can do. And now that there's so much more data in the world that we can actually access, which is what I love about MongoDB as well, it allows you to access all that data and get insights from it. Uh, I think that makes it amazing and what we can do. All right. Well, so what's the least favorite part of the job? Well, uh, I have three young girls and we are headquartered in New York. So I would say the bus in the sky. The bus and the sky. Yes. Um, that's funny. You know, I was reading about it and I, I hadn't put two and two together, but founders of DoubleClick are also the founders of, yes. which makes sense because they founded it in New York. And, uh, I actually met Kevin Ryan years ago. Oh, he's uh, amazing. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so what's your proudest moment as a marketer? Doesn't have to be here, but just in your, in your career, what's your sort of, what's your greatest hit? Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly have to say going public in October of 2017 was an amazing experience. Okay. Um, so 
that's what the company did. Is there something that you as a marketer where you put a program together and you went, wow, that just killed it. That was a grand slam. I mean, in, in reference to that moment in time, learning, first of all, it was my first time going public. So learning what that takes, uh, the amount of media that you have to get in front of, there's a large quiet period and then you go big in one day and then you go quiet again, um, rallying the company. There's so much excitement around it. Working with, we work with NASDAQ, all the learnings around that, being a public company, just, uh, just really a lot of, uh, first time experiences. Okay. All right. I get it. I mean, it must have been amazing and, and, and incredibly exciting. And I hadn't really considered the internal aspect of this as well, because the folks want to know what that, what it's going to mean for them. And without employees, we don't have a company. So what, um, would you say is the most renegade thing you've done in your career? You know, people often are surprised by my transition from uh, being a VP of demand gen at DocuSign and customer acquisition and switching to a very heavily focused tech developer um, audience with MongoDB. So they're, I think, surprised by that uh, switch. Uh, but I think if you know the core functions of marketing and you're networking, learning continually, I mean, I just had to surround myself with people that focused on developers and our audience, and, and I had to learn a lot about the product and open source, uh, it's definitely doable. And I think having, you know, when you go and get your MBA, you really think about, it's not so much the industry, you learn sort of models and best practices, and you should be able to apply them to many different industries and personas. And I think that this is a testament that you can do that. Um, yes. Uh, my friend Kim Whitler, at, who is a, a professor of marketing at, at the Darden School in Virginia, bemoans the fact that those that don't have some fundamental training really don't understand what the job is, don't have a discipline. Um, so uh, totally uh, get that. Yes. Um, and we had DocuSign, we had Scott Ulrich on the, oh, very nice. um, yes. uh, on the show uh, several months ago. Anyway, okay. Um, is there a brand that you admire the most that I, I that hasn't been mentioned on the show? But I know you haven't listened to episodes. So, is there a brand that you admire most that isn't Apple? Oh, I, you know, so certainly in our space, uh -huh. uh, I love what they're doing over at PagerDuty. Uh, say, I think, say the brand again. Uh, PagerDuty. They also focus on developers. It's a woman-led CEO, uh, Jennifer Tejada, and I think that uh, just her philosophy and. The way she, she's balanced her team out. I think it's 50% female leadership, 50% engineers and just her, her give back. She already has, you know, she's part of the 1%. And I just, I really like the philosophy and uh, what they're doing over there. Well, very cool. We'll, we'll look up that company and you mentioned, um, and, and I know you're very involved in, uh, women in tech. Yes. Talk about that. Sure. So I'm a founding advisor for women 2.0, which really encourages um, supporting and educating um, and mentoring uh, women. Uh, also, just recently this week, went to a dinner that was hosted by a woman who was very successful in tech and then founded her own winery and business, uh, uh, Pfeiffer, up in uh, Napa. And uh, so that was kind of fun to see her, what she went through to build that and how she's in that, what she considers to be a male-dominated industry and, and learning from her. And I just, you know, we do a lot at MongoDB uh, with our women's group. We recently, we have five months parental leave, uh, gender agnostic. Uh, so we're doing a lot as well to make sure we have the right infrastructure at work um, to support uh, women and men. It's very cool. I, I've been talking to a couple of uh, CMO friends and talking about just doing an episode focused on what it means to be uh, a woman CMO and it, are there differences and so forth. And, um, but, w but I think, well, I'm going to save that, uh, for another episode. What do you think is that, is there a recent book that made you rethink things? Uh, you know, I, I took on an executive coach this year and she's actually, I would say is even more of a life coach for me. Uh, she's been amazing, Kristen, um, Cobble. And one of the books she recommended was Unconscious Parenting. <laughs> And uh, having three girls, nine, oh seven, and four, uh, I think your your home life needs to be balanced as well as your work life. And really good parenting tips and techniques. And both my husband and I read it, and I think uh, it, it even some can apply at work. But uh, it's it was a good book for me. It's it's fun, yeah. yeah. I and I I think that part of the this as, as a parent who's made it over the hump, and my kids are out and off the payroll, uh, and. And, and doing fine 
it, you know, there, there, you need some permission to have a sense that this is a, what you're doing is actually okay. Yes. yes. <laughs> right. And, and so particularly when you're working really hard and you have this big job and you're juggling all these things. So, um, that makes sense. We'll, we'll link to that, that book. Um, okay. So best advice you were ever given. Yes, sales alignment in the marketing world, certainly in B2B uh, enterprise marketing and SaaS, is really making sure that you're partnering with your sales team and they're an internal customer. And it's no fun to work at a company where those two functions don't align. And I've had really good luck and success at MongoDB um, aligning with the head of sales and understanding their challenges, what we need to put in place, having their support when I needed budget and headcount. Uh, so um, I really had a great relationship with Carlos De La Torre uh, as a CRO. And uh, I think he um, just that alignment was a lot of um, a lot of good success for us. Very cool. I think that's a great place for us to pause because I want to dive into that a little bit more uh, when we get back. So stay with us. Hey, it's Drew. I wanted to use this break to ask you a single question. Are you a courageous marketer? Do you have the courage to go to your board of directors and say marketing could drive the growth of this company? We just need three times the budget. Do you have the courage to take the big idea that you already have and extend it internally and externally through influencers, through the media, through all of your content? If you're a courageous marketer but aren't sure how to roadmap all of this, I have a big idea for you. It's called Renegade Thinking. It's a program that we've developed and work with exclusively for B2B marketers, generally at large companies. And I want to give you my cell phone, 917-679-8852. Just text Renegade Thinking to 917-679-8852, and we can talk about how you can cut through. Okay, we're back. Uh, and my guest is Megan Eisenberg, the CMO of MongoDB. And we were talking about sales and marketing alignment and what a lot of organizations suffer from is marketing is really good at driving leads, sales qualified leads. In fact, that was, you know, in your data. Um, and then just saying, here you go. See ya. Um, and, and, uh, that's obviously problematic for any number of, of reasons. How have you, since you've, you've talked about getting sales and marketing alignment, how have you, what are some of the things that you did to sort of make that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important, one, that you build together. So you create the models, you create, you understand the persona and align around it. You understand the funnel and how it's going to convert. Uh, and that there is uh, that, you know, even if you're going to do lead scoring, that everything is built together. Uh, I also think that habitual communication matters. It's not enough to, to say it up front. You have to check in. You have to have a feedback loop uh, and continually uh, improve. Uh, it's never over. Every two, three weeks, there's a new thing you've got to smooth out. It's, you know, in some ways, it's like a manufacturing floor. You're going to have bottlenecks. I was APIC certified out of college. I was a IT engineer for master schedulers and really learned a lot uh, through that. And I think leads are the same way. You have lead flow and they go different paths and there's different things that stop them from getting in the hands of sales, whether it's the qual team or the systems that you use. Uh, and I think that Today, you, you, there's such an amazing tech stack between marketing and sales that gives you the visibility uh, that you need to, to facilitate communication, handoff, and follow-up, um, that really investing in that stack matters. Okay, so let's, uh, you said a lot there, yes. and, and, it's, and it's all interesting. So the first point of building together, um, I get, and when you talked about building together, you mentioned persona um, or personas. Uh, talk a little bit about, I mean, how many personas do you have? Sure. So, I mean, we we certainly, developers are core. You know, the future of our business is developers, and they're choosing the tools that they build the apps on, and they're really influencing the C-level. So developers a major one. Also, I would say the C-level um, executive who's trying to transform their business, the digital transformation. They're trying to modernize a very, you know, a legacy stack. Um, that's been around for 40 years. You think about databases, relational has been around 40 years. It's definitely time for disruption. Uh, so they're thinking about these things. How do we innovate and modernize? 
And then and at the level of, uh, you know, the VP of engineering, head of IT, that is trying to also look at what they're building. And they're, you know, very expensive resources. There was a study that just came out that talked, I think it was by Stripe, that talked about 80% of developers' time is actually used fixing, correcting bugs and code and maintenance. And they don't get as much time on the innovation, the building. And so we uh, really pride ourselves on educating that how fast you can move with MongoDB. It's a natural way to work with data, with the document model. So I, I know a little bit about developers, although it's dated uh, years ago. Renegade worked with IBM to target developers. I mean, literally, this is probably 15 years ago. And it's a quirky group of people. But I imagine today, given the fact that every one of your competitors knows that all roads lead to them, and it's not just, you know, the database, it would be the e-commerce platforms that would want to do it. So you've got a huge range of people fighting for the attention of the developer. So what kind of insights have you found that have helped you connect better with this really interesting head down um, primarily male still, you know, um, how have you found a way to, to connect with these individuals? I think there's a couple of ways. One, the product, of course, we have really good product market fit. And uh, so by word of mouth and, and social media, they are actually social and uh, they're out there. We have over 575,000 developers that follow us on social media channels. So um, we interact and engage with them on social. They're talking about the product, how they're using it. We have a lot of great customer use cases. Um, we've got uh, Coinbase and massive brands like Barclays. And so having that customer voice that they look to and um, sets example, that's certainly an amazing way that I think to speak to any persona, right? They want to look at other customers and developers, what they're doing, and then on the channels they want to be found on, which seems to be social and online. A lot of folks are, whether on Hacker News or Stack Overflow or Quora, they're out there asking questions, engaging, and then we have a thriving university. We crossed a million uh a million developers in our university platform this year and just tells you they're, they're trying to learn and they want to learn and use the hottest technology out there. And question, I didn't get a chance to investigate the university. A lot of brands, uh, we had um, uh, the CMO of Demandbase for, and they've created a, a wonderful school, if you will, for account-based marketing and they charge for it. Ah, interesting. Right. And it's, I, Sure, it's a revenue model or certainly a break even. Is your university free? Uh, yes. It is. A lot of it is free. Yes. If you want to bring it into your business, um, that there's other structures that you can do, but right. yes, the university is free. You can download an app. We have an app that you can download. And is it, uh, do you un- end up with a certification? Yes, we have certifications as well. Okay. And those are free as well? Yes. Okay. So it's interesting because those are the two sort of alternative models in that, you know, uh, you, you charge for it, that gets a more serious customer, more committed, they want to complete it. Um, on the other hand, it closes down the world and developers. Because your, your product initially is an open source product that they could actually get for free, right? Yes, yes, we're an open source um, product at the core. Yeah, so it would make sense that uh, as an open source product, and again, if you're in the developer mindset, the notion of having to charge to learn how to use this thing is just plain annoying. Yes, yeah. no, it's, it's true. And okay. actually what I love is they, they teach MongoDB at a lot of top um, universities, computer science universities. Uh, Yale being a, a great example uh, teaches MongoDB in their computer science courses. Is that a coincidence? Uh, it's not. <laughs> it is a coincidence. Yes, actually I get to go back uh, once a year and teach a computer science management class uh, in October. And I love that the students know MongoDB because that's the what they were taught. In the class. So if you're not a developer and you haven't heard of MongoDB, DB, it's okay. Um, uh, so very interesting as we're talking about this universe, highly targeted thing. One of the questions, you use the term funnel. There's a lot of dispute in B2B whether in fact there really is such a thing as a funnel anymore because the buying process, particularly on the enterprise level, is so long and circuitous. You get the, you get your mobilizer involved and then they serve it up and then the CFO comes in and says, we got to start again because I need this. And then the IT person get, and there's this long 
you mentioned funnel though, and you and sort of described things in that way. Um, is it because at the end of the day you got to get this? The developer is the the mobilizer, and if you sell them, you're good. You know, I use funnel because I think it's a great model to talk about the stages someone goes through to buy from you. And you're right; some people go through it multiple times. Some people go through it faster than others. And my job is to get as many people in it and through it. Uh, and increase the velocity of it. You know, I love the serious decisions model. I think it makes a lot of sense for B2B, understanding the stages, because I think people, uh, and they really think about, you know, oh, leads and then pipeline, and they forget there's this whole qualification process that goes on in the middle. And by using a serious decisions model, you can not only talk about the leads coming in, how they're qualified, the handoff to the SDRs, the handoff to sales, the close, and then keeping them as customers. And it allows you to track it through systems like Salesforce. And we use Eloqua as our marketing automation platform and full circle CRM to help us really track those stages. Uh, and uh, we found it a great way to understand our business. Um, okay. Uh, are you using MongoDB to market MongoDB? Is the da- your database at the back of your marketing? It is our website. So our CMS <laughs> is MongoDB and we're built on MongoDB. Uh, so from that standpoint, yes, uh, we have a, um, a whole sort of data warehouse project um, where we have a lot of data on, as well on our product that we use to better market and follow up as you go through the registration process. So um, I've had, I know I've, this, I'm almost, we're over 100 episodes, so I forget sometimes, yes. uh, but we did have uh, an amazing interview with someone who was in the data lake from Looker, Jan from Looker. Uh, Jen Grant. Jen Grant. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. So um, what is the difference between what you do and a data lake? So I would say it's a good question. A data lake, I would say, is where you're going and your data, you're you're pulling in data from a lot of different areas and you're doing analytics on it. Uh, We are mostly known as operational database where an app, let's imagine an app, a bunch of users get on the app. And you've got, they're reading and writing information in real time. It's very alive. Or a data lake may be something where you've collected data over time and you're running analytics on it. And it's instead of having to wait two days, a week, two weeks to get information back, you can quickly run against the data lake. We are used as a data lake as well. There are instances where MongoDB is used as uh, an analytical database, not just operational. Okay. And, and that's way too technical for the audience. <laughs> We're going to take a break. And then we come back, I really want to dig into the things that you've learned about account-based marketing and how this has really helped uh, drive your business forward. You've been listening to another great interview on Renegade Thinkers Unite with Drew Neiser. But the value doesn't end there. As a listener, you can download a free ebook from Drew, Renegade Thinkers, interviews with 11 trailblazing CMOs any business can learn from. Top marketing thought leaders and proven executives from Time Warner, American Express, and Chico's, and others. Get your free copy at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. For listeners only at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. Okay, we're back. And we're going to... I'm Megan Eisenberg, CMO of MongoDB. We just got very technical for a second. I want to step back. You mentioned that you use Eloqua. Um... Let's talk about your marketing technology stack and how, first of all, how are you getting folks into the pipeline to begin with? What is the hook that's starting all of this uh, conversation? Sure. Well, certainly we have the benefit of open source. We have massive amount of visitors on our website uh, to our docs to learn about our products to the university. So a lot of it is making sure we have valuable information where they're willing to exchange their information for it. Uh, so I would say majority comes through our website. And part of that is making sure we have really good content. And then also we have a pretty robust field strategy. Uh, we are in a lot of the cloud ecosystems, uh, reInvent and uh, the AWS summits, as well as GCP and Azure cloud events. And then we do a lot of dot locals and our world event uh, in New York every year. So we're definitely in the field and we have uh, dev advocates that are out there in the language coding language communities uh, and um, learning and, and working with the product and teaching others about our product. Uh, so that's really the, you know, the field and online brings everyone in. Right. Okay. So, yeah, because eventually you need to touch people physically too. And I know yes. the developers appreciate that. And, and, and uh, it, we had some wonderful programs with, with developers over the years. So, but the content, 
What um, other than I mean, we could we could say the free databases, the, the tool itself is a content. The university is content, but are there you know is it blog content? Is it white papers? Is it research? What is it that's sort of particularly uh, of interest? And and are you publishing every day? I mean, what's because this is a big issue for marketers is content. Yes. You know, a lot of it is that draws people in our white papers. Uh, we do blog. Uh, we're always trying to um, up the amount of blogs that we put out there, but we certainly have technical blogs. Uh, we have thought leadership pieces. We have product pieces. We have how to use the app and a lot of customer stories. And people want to see what others in their industry are doing. And um, so by having these compelling customer stories, uh, you get a lot of um, interest uh, around that. And it's it's a lot more compelling than us telling the story, for sure. So white papers have been around a long time. A lot of people are doing white papers, blogs, and so forth. And there, But there's something like 2 million new blog posts going up every day. Wow. That's uh, like a lot of blog posts. Um, how are you, are you, are you using media to help make sure that those things bubble up when a developer does a search? I'm looking for this topic. I mean, how do you make sure that, because you can't just post it on your website and say they'll, they'll You're come. right. They don't. Uh, so there's a lot of work around SEO, making sure you're using the terms that people are searching for, making sure that you're, um, you're seen as the domain authority on that topic. So having, you know, certainly the eyeballs creates more eyeballs, but if you have linking, really looking at your linking strategy, how do other sites link to you? How often when someone actually goes into your site or finds you through search, do they stay and read the content? So all of that uh, matters. And so really making sure you're putting the content people are searching for, and then you're seen as the domain authority. So when they, you know, you're trying to get your organic search up, which is not a quick fix, certainly. You got to build that over time. Okay. So we have a lot of content that's sort of there. We have a lot of people who are finding you. You have very positive word of mouth. What's the challenge for you right now? Yeah, I, I think always trying to, you know, get awareness of all. We have a lot of products. You've got, you know, MongoDB Atlas, uh, which I mentioned is a database as a service. We've got uh, MongoDB Stitch which is serverless platform. We've got our BI connector. We've got charts. Uh, you know, we just, we're, we do amazing work on creating products. So how do I get awareness of all these different products out there in the market? And at some point, and this will be interesting when you get there, at some point you will max out on digital spend. It is inevitable because right, right. And it sure. happens. And it was interesting, uh, as we had the uh, CMO of Zoom and they actually went with an outdoor strategy. Yes. I see them all over airports. It, you name it, freeway. And it's and it's actually, you know, now their product is even more, I'm going to say, consumer broad usage than yours, although it's still, for the most part, it's a B2B mm -hmm. um, kind of a sell, so it would be interesting. But you're from a media spend, because I, I know I, I read about this, it, you spend most of your dollars on digital. We do, although we just did our first billboard. It's on 101 right now on the way from the airport to San Francisco, and it's friends don't let real friends use relational databases. So as you come in for Oracle Open World, we want to send a little um, public service announcement to you. So How that'll nice be of you. Yes, yes, the next wow. two months. Wow. So. Who says guerrilla marketing is dead? <laughs> That's right. Um, that's so funny. So take a little uh, dig at the, uh, I could imagine there could be a whole level of this. Uh, sure. Because uh, so uh, Oracle is the enemy here. I, certainly they're the uh, legacy uh, database and it, it doesn't hurt that a lot of people don't like them and that they're held to the, you know, you're, you're not too many alternatives and we're actually a real alternative. So yes. <laughs> and it's helpful to have an enemy, such a clear enemy like this. And, sure. uh, cause you know what, you know, you can sort of, you know what they've done, what their record is, and it's very hard for them to act like a startup. Uh, definitely. <laughs> they can't. Uh, they cannot. They can't. Right. And so... And frankly, they were built before really the mass amount of data, 40 years right. ago, before iPhones. Right. And they weren't built to deal with the mass amount of data you need for an app running on your phone and to react in such quick moments. Think of Lyft. Think of these apps where there's millions of people all of a sudden and it, the, the app needs to continually update. They just can't do that. Interesting. So you have a, in that sense, because of the way yours is designed, just a speed advantage. Yes. Yes. Flat out. Uh, 
That's interesting because I didn't get that uh, immediately, but and that's just a structural advantage because you were built in more recently. Well, we're, we're yes, with the document model, the JSON model, we're not um, stuck to rows and tables. You put all the information that logically makes sense on one document, so you're not doing the queries across multiple tables that often take time to write that and bring it in. You're, everything's in the place that needs to be to access immediately. I think I understand that. Uh, I'm imagining that Oracle is one giant Excel spreadsheet. Uh, yes. And you're more like, more there's, ex- there's Word docs, there's ex- spreadsheets, the PowerPoint, and you're able to get the data Graphics, from all of them. Yes. Everything from there. Okay. Um, I've really simplified that probably uh, well beyond, but in a way that I can understand it. So as you look at, so, um, there is a limited pool of developers, one would argue. So building awareness, uh, is, you know, getting top of mind for them is important now. You have this challenge of, hey, by the way, we have these other products, which is a whole new set of developers potentially that mm-hmm. might be interested. Um, and I saw that you mentioned in another interview that you're both a B2B and a B2C marketer. That's right. Talk about that a little bit and what challenge that represents for you in terms of setting up your team and looking at your business. Oh, it's such a great question. So, yes, uh, when I think about um, B2B, certainly we have an enterprise sales team. When you think about B2B, you're supporting someone in sales to so go sell. And we have an enterprise, which I would say $750 million in revenue above. And we have a corporate team, which is on the phone. So enterprise in the field mainly, uh, corporate teams on the phone calling and selling. And when we switch to B2C or B2D, B2Developer, that's people coming direct to your website. They register. They give their credit card. And they start using your product without ever talking to anyone in sales. And um, when we launched our, our first really self-serve product two years ago, Atlas, uh, it really, we had to change the way we brought them in. And that was a different skill set. It's a lot of the SEO, the digital, growth-minded marketers, the, the experience on the, the form and the experience within the product because you want to make it as frictionless as possible. And to get in front of them is so different than um, trying to go with the B2B sales force. So uh, you're right. I think if you look at teams that are in the developer world, like a Twilio or um, maybe a Stripe, when you look at their marketing teams, they're about 10% of an org. Uh, so 80 people, uh, even HubSpot, they were a lot really self-serve. They didn't have an enterprise sales team. They had corporate. Uh, they were always about 10% of the org. And so B2B you tend to be about 5% of the org with slightly different skill sets. And if you think about it, B2B is all about leads. Uh, self-serve is all about user acquisition. And that's a username and a password versus first name, last name, company, industry, phone number, the thing a salesperson would need to follow up on. And so when someone's coming to your site, you need to quickly determine, are they going to go in front of sales or are you directing them to self-serve? What information do you need? The more you ask for self-serve, the less they're going to fill it out. Well, it went really with either group, but you need enough information sales can follow up if it's a B2B model. You really don't need as much. You just need the user on your platform and then you may need to make it so obvious what you do and what to do to go from a free tier to a paid tier within the product. Wow. Okay. So lots of questions that I, that I want to sort of, uh, get into because it feels like, because anybody is annoying, you know, they talk about when form fills, whether it's corporate or otherwise, people put in false information, uh, particularly this new Gen Z, forget millennials. I mean, the Gen Z are really, it's like, if you can't figure out who I am just by my cookie, you know, I'm not going to bother. Yes. But, and so they're, they're putting the wrong information. What I'm wondering is, is there artificial intelligence or other tools that can simply do that for you? So you still only need about the same amount of information from uh, both. Yes. Yeah, so there definitely is. There's a lot of tools that can give you industry and company information. Mm-hmm. So we use demand base on the back end. We use inside view. We d- use discover org. Uh, Social123, now called Cynthio. And what that does is a lot of them will look at the IP address. They'll tell you a lot of location, so company, state, uh, information. The actual company, they'll tell you the industry they're in, if they're residential, com- you know, commercial. It's like 40 different attributes you can get just from IP address. They also will look at the domain of the email address and give you a lot of information, maybe another 10 or 15% more information. So you can do that on the back end. You don't have to ask. Where you tend to have to ask is on the personal information name, right? You want to address them. And we know if we address them by their first name, they're more likely to review, engage, convert. And if you're going to follow up phone number, 
Now, if it's self-serve and they can go in, you don't need the phone number. If you really want to have a sales team follow-up, phone number, you're right. A lot of people give you inaccurate phone numbers, so you follow up on email. If you don't give us a real email address, you actually can't get into the product. Right. And you can't, right. you don't get the asset if you're trying to get a white right. paper or something. So there, we tend to get accurate email addresses. Right. Um, but not necessarily phone numbers. Right. Okay. So, but what, what really, uh, rings interesting to me is that as the marketer of a software service product, you're the salesperson as well. You're creating a revenue stream that, yes. that as a CMO is in some ways very gratifying. It's like, whoa, we just forget, you know, you guys keep doing what you're doing over here, but we're going to drive some big revenue yes. direct. That's kind of cool. It is. It is. And, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a definitely a partnership between marketing and engineering. I would say B2B is marketing and sales partnership and B2D or B2C is marketing and engineering because it's so much about the product experience and that handoff, you bring them in, but then they have to have an amazing experience to stay register on the product and then use it and pay for it. So within the engineering team, do you have some CX people who are like experts and sort of say, well, this is how Amazon does it and they're really good. Um, so they, cause you're an e-commerce company. Yes. Right. Yeah. We Selling? definitely have a good UX team. Right. Uh, that constantly looks at user behaviors and tries to make the best experience possible. Um, so last question in this thing is that the skill set that it takes for you, for your team, for e-commerce versus driving sales for, you know, enterprise level, it's, those are vastly different marketing skill sets. Do you divide the group up? It's a very good question and, and we're, you know, we think about it many different ways. I do think as the company grows and uh, as you think about the different functions, you've got to have a demand center that supports both. So things like email marketing, um, things like creative resources, operations and metrics can be in one. But when you think about programs and demand gen, uh, where you need someone to think about the persona and how you're trying to reach them, you need to separate those, those groups. So, um, you mentioned, I'm going to guess five or six different marketing technologies that you're yes. using. Um, we have 28. 28 different marketing technologies. How do you have one that sits on top of them that makes them all work together? Well, not <laughs> completely. Eloqua is our marketing automation platform right. and maybe a third of them integrate into either Eloqua or Salesforce. Uh, you know, a lot of it is optimizing your website, optimizing for conversions, optimizing for personalization, and then the, the channel you need to reach them on. There's a whole set of tools around social media. We use Sprinkler, which we love, built on MongoDB, of course. Uh, I saw and, that case history, yes. <laughs> yes. And, Good when you can use your customers. Yes. And, and so we've got Insightful. We have a ton of different social technologies for those channels. We have a bunch for our website. And then we have tools that give us, you know, more information for our sales team, you know, ways of appending information. Uh, so, yeah, we have a lot. And how much of this, you know, because there's so much data and the challenge, of course, is sorting through the data and finding the sort of the gems from the noise. How much of that do you personally get involved in or do you have like a just a data person that just does that for you? So I'm definitely involved in looking at the different technologies. Uh, I do have a VP of Systems Operations Demand Center that is the expert in the APIs, the integrations, really validating, yes, this, this is going to do what they actually say they're going to do. What they've sold, the, the promise they've sold you, yes, I've looked under the covers, it's true, we'll get the data we need, and, and they're running the metrics on it. Wow. Okay. I just, uh, 28 is, is mind boggling. But as a tech company, you sort of, sort of believe that tech can help you get It's there. a huge advantage, right? If you can figure out and access this data and then get insights from it and make decisions faster than your competitors, then you have it. And we've sunset seven technologies in three years. So we've gone through about 35. Interesting. And given the fact that everybody's buying everybody, one would expect that these things are going to consolidate. I mean, just with Adobe, you know, sure. or with Salesforce, Oracle, they're yeah. all building their marketing clouds out. Exactly. Yes. Uh, so one in, and it'd be interesting for a, an organization like yours, whether that makes it better or worse. I think if they integrate them when they purchase them and it's on a platform, it makes it better. Okay. All right. So are there, as you're looking ahead, um, is there a challenge that you just, you know, that as you look at all this marketing technology out there that you really wish they could solve right now? 
buyer's intent, I think, matters. You know, there's a lot of information we can get, but, uh, you know, the not only buyer's intent, but timing. Because people come to you at different stages, and it would be great to actually know if they're how close they are to buying. Right. Uh, because we have massive volumes of leads, you know, 200,000 a quarter. How do you know if I could put 10,000 of them in front of sales? I want to put the ones that are going to buy now. Interesting. Uh, years ago, it was actually seven years ago, I interviewed John Miller when he was at Marketo, one of the founders of, of that. And he at that moment said, we know that when someone clicks on our pricing page. Sure. And I've, I've, I've also read some studies from Google when they type in a brand name like MongoDB, they're at the decision criteria because they're not just saying, oh, I need a, a, database in the cloud or database as a service, they actually are aware of you and they're probably looking at your competitors as well. And that is a good indication that they're close to buying. Well, um, I want to congratulate you on the continued success. Wish you Thank more you. success. Um, as we wrap this up and you think about, let's just focus on, on MarTech and building this stack. All right, can you offer two do's and a don't for the listeners of the, your fellow CMOs in, in the, in sitting in a company, uh, but not this company? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think when I look at all the MarTech, uh, one, you have to be able to digest it. So we certainly didn't buy 28 in the first month. Uh, we bought the ones that we needed to get, you know, the baseline in and we needed to be able to have an implementation plan and digest it. Uh, and as the company grew and we were coming up against problems, we added more technology. I think that matters. I think core to any marketing team to move fast is you've got to have, you know, good web development, website, ability to change and move quickly. You've got to have creative lead that allows you to, to whether it's in, you know, in person, in the field, print, online, over email, over social media, you need to be able to make it a consistent brand no matter how it goes out. And then you need the content, whether that's great product marketing, um, content or leaders, and then maybe some demand and expertise to take that to market, right? You've got to be able to syndicate it through all those channels. Okay. And then the don't was just don't do it all at once. Don't do it all at <laughs> once. That's right. That's right. And, you know, in marketing, there's a thousand things you can be doing. It's very visible and everyone has an opinion. And I think being able to prioritize and state what you're working on, it matters a lot. Because I think if you try to do all of it, you'll always not meet someone's expectation. Focus is your friend. Yes. 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 All right. Well, Megan, thank you so much for being on Renegade Thinkers Unite. Thank you for having me. And to all, all of our listeners, you have a lot to digest. Uh, we, we will, of course, uh, the show notes are available. We'll provide great detail on, on some of this information. Um, I'm so grateful that you spent the time with us. As always, um, you can thank. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend. Sharing is caring. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. <laughs>